quarantine and have their food uh, delivered, but the majority of the world did not have the luxury of a continuous salary in their bank accounts. And those serving the front lines as care, healthcare workers and caregivers, they kept us all at home. Um, we also knew that women uh, were on the forefront of care work in uh, much larger quantities than men. And we are seeing now that they are returning to work at a much slower pace uh, than in decades of uh, progress on, on gender equality. That's why we welcome the State of the World's uh, Fathers 2023 report today as an advocacy platform for the important work of transforming patriarchal masculinities, challenging prevailing social norms and calling for transformed power structures in relation to care. The report offers us a critical tool as we approach the inaugural commemoration of the International Day uh, of Care and Support. Um, uh, this year, the UN General Assembly passed a groundbreaking resolution to mark this International Day every October 29th. So we will be celebrating it uh, next week. The call of the transformation of uh, care economy is long lasting and, and lies at the core of achieving gender equality. Uh, this transformation is rooted in upholding human rights, uh, enhancing individual and societal well being and prosperity, and is central to altering perceptions regarding women's access to power and resources. Men and boys are important allies there, and we need to continue working on engaging them to change this. Even though uh, many men may perceive themselves as equally responsible for uh, caregiving, uh, empirical data doesn't say so. Uh, it reveals that, uh, and according to ILO, um, International Labour Organization, women, uh, as was said in the video, spend on average three more hours per day on care and domestic work. This translates to 12.5 billion hours a day spent on unpaid caregiving, equivalent to 1.5 billion people working eight hours every day without compensation. Imagine the potential if women could get some of this time back and the impacts on their opportunities, education, autonomy, and health, the benefit would extend beyond individuals to our societies and economies. It's evident that this transformation will also be beneficial to men. Um, men's participation in and redistribution of caregiving responsibilities is not just a matter of equality. Uh, it also creates space for men to develop emotionally, uh, establish stronger relationships, and drive their self-worth from roles other than being providers. Um, Fathers who actively engage in caregiving duties tend to remain involved in their children uh, as their children grow, consequently providing positive role models and fostering more equitable social norms for generations. Our existing structures, institutions, and systems and of power have normalized and prioritized traditional male roles. Uh, we need to evaluate how patriarchal roles and gender norms influence the policies and institutions responsible for current caregiving dynamics and then shift them. We need all stakeholders on board to create this change. Finally, I would like to emphasize the pivotal role of fathers in reshaping caregiving uh, uh, dynamics and advancing gender equality. However, as someone who's not a father myself, uh, but with caregiving responsibilities for family members, let me also be clear that there requires all men to be action uh, agents for change. We all should must demonstrate commitment to promoting gender equality beyond the confines of our homes, uh, our communities, workplaces, and among our peers. We must strive to expand our reach and 
work collaboratively to affect change, fostering gender equality in this all spheres of society, because when we have equality, everyone thrives. Now, let us turn to the panel. And um, I am so happy that I spoke first before Gary, because he's a much more eloquent and charming speaker. So I got to speak first. And now it's your turn, uh, who, um, because you are the one who's been leading the development of Equimondo states of the World Fathers Report. So um, if you may share with us the most significant findings of that, please. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think we'll have some slides up there. Yeah, great. Um, I was, first off, Mohammed did not um, mention the big study and partnership that we did in the MENA region where he was the original director there, Brian Hellman, um, Assistant Director of Research from Equimundo also was one of the co-leaders on it. So, um, Mohammed, you've been leading some really important work in this space as well. Thank you for making me great to, about uh, Great to see you, of course. Um, I was you know, reminded of the universality of care in the last 24 hours. Um, I got in early this morning from Los Angeles. I was at an event with um, the Television Academy, the folks who won the Emmys, talking about stories of men in television. Um, and I was lucky that on the front row in the audience among producers, et cetera, is my daughter. Um, she works in Los Angeles in media representation, how to influence storytelling. And I was thinking about the um, 25 years that it took to get to the moment that she is now financially self-sufficient. <laughs> so those of you with children a little bit younger, if you're thinking, how many years will I be supporting this? Um, I can give you my average in one data point of 25 years. Um, as she's leading me to the Uber, um, I get a text from my partner, she's Brazilian, we talk in Portuguese most of the time, she says, oi amor, hello honey, and she sent me a picture of her positive COVID test, and I thought, I may shit, <laughs> so, no. what can I do? Um, she works in frontline health care, she and her colleagues kept the community clinic open throughout the worst moments of COVID. Um, and so I will need to change my travel plans. And instead of her coming to meet me here, I'm going to be on the train later today, heading back so that I can do my caregiving. And of course, while I'm at the airport, my mother who's worried about who's going to cook during Thanksgiving a month from now, um, 85 year old, amazing, good health, but very worried about the family coming to town. I was like, oh yeah, this is the universality of what we have. This is care. Um, lastly, I was glad that I found some clean socks for myself this morning to do a little bit of self-care to get to get here. Um, and I think the you know this video clip I think just holds up how universal this is. That universality, though, men have not been encouraged to embrace to be part of that universality, to be supported, to do our part. We started Men Care as a global campaign in 2011 with our partners in Smoky Gender Justice in South Africa. UN Women, UNICEF, UNFPA, partners on different activities with this big goal that men should care about care. It's the hands-on work that men need to do every day, but also to center it in our lives the way it is for women, to do our share of it, to experience the joys of it, and to acknowledge just how universal it is in our lives. We started in 2015, the State of the World's Fathers Report, to take, to give a big picture of how are we coming in that. Um, I wish the news were better, there is some good news, um, but we really have designed it to be a bit of a scorecard with the amount of data that we can find. And time use data is never exactly what we want, but um, of trying to ask the question, how are we with bringing men into the conversation about care? And this probably works here, there we go, yep. If we, we this is data from uh, 17 countries, representative household samples, mostly skewed toward caregivers, so it's not completely nationally representative. Um, questions about that, I will point as well to Brian, who I mentioned before, who's one of the lead authors, together with Tabishi, um, Gupta at our team, Nikki Vandegog, that some of you know, and Bessel Vandenberg on our team, we're all co-authors of the study. Um, one is that, you know, just reaffirming what I said, we are all enmeshed in care activities. If we count our care for our partners, care for ourselves, care for elderly parents, care for the disabled family members that about 15% of households in the world have and care for children. Um, there's almost no one who doesn't have 
important care activities. Um, good news is that men say they care about care. The number here, 70 to 90% of men across these countries say, I feel as responsible for care work as my partner. Now we usually step into the next question with saying, are men doing the amount of care that men say they are doing? Um, there's lots of punchlines we have about that. There's lots of, but the serious point is, we don't think men are doing all of that. What do we need to do to get the world to support men to do the care that men says they say they want to do? The good news is they say they care. But as we look across, you, you heard some data points in the video just now, no matter any kind of care activity that we look, women are doing more. The gap in some countries is narrowing. We have typically given the number of around three times the amount of care work that men do compared to women. It is narrowing in some countries, but there's no country, even those that have the best parental leave and have achieved greater equality for women, Scandinavian countries and a few others, no countries achieved equality in terms of um, unpaid care and who does it, no matter which kind you look at, with the exception of one kind of care that men do more than women, and that is self-care. Um, so that is uh, something that, you know, those of us who identify as male kind of shudder at that one and think we've got some work to do. But I'm going to come back to that point because it's not, um, there's also something positive for us to pull out of that. Um, COVID is probably the biggest reason that in many countries men seem to be doing more. We know from you and women data and other studies that during COVID, everybody did more. <laughs> Depending on households, sometimes it was women doing even more, even as men started to do more. We don't know with 100% accuracy kind of where we are since, but um, I think the next questions will be, did this shift remote work being possible for some workers and some not, of course? Um, did this shift hang on? Are men, did, was this shift permanent? Will it be lasting? What can we do to see that some of these changes and men say they're doing more. Again, these are self-reports. We didn't, we don't have cameras in people's homes to actually me measure number of minutes, but these are self-reports. Um, it does appear that COVID led to some changes. I'm going over the data points kind of quickly. They are in the report. Am I stuck there? Nope. There we go. A little bit slower. We talk a lot about individual men. The report does say State of the World's Fathers report. We do see this about building a world that encourages, demands, makes possible men's full participation in care. Of course, we need to hold individual men accountable for the amount of care work that we do, but it's much more, we believe, about changing the structures around men. What's clear for men and women is that we don't have the services we need. Whether we look at access to paid care, whether it's too expensive, whether I don't have any subsidized care, um, whether the hours of leave that I have, we can add up the number of obstacles that women and men cite um, in terms of being able to provide all the care they want to be able to provide. And an important and interesting data point as well, where families say they have access to care and support, they report care as being more enjoyable than exhaustive. No matter which way we count it, women count care as more exhaustive than men, um, even when they have support services. Um, and that was a key point of that video that we saw at the very beginning. We'll go into details around parental leave. Um, um, that's, that's, that's really, really one, one of the kind of low hanging fruits as policy that's out there. We are on a slow trajectory in the world of more parental leave being available. It is still on average about three times more leave for mothers than for fathers. Many countries continue to do shared leave approaches, which we know means continuing to have the use of that leave by women. We know that even when men have access to leave, in the countries that offer the most generous leave, men tend to take about half of it, whereas women take about to 90 plus percent of the leave available to them. Why do men say they're not doing leave in our studies and others? They don't think they will be seen positively in their workplaces if they take the leave. So even when we change policies, the norm changes have to be part of this. Um, here's where we think and where we land in this report. We have to get men involved, not only in doing the hands-on care work, but to be activists for care work alongside women. If we look at who has been carrying the flag for the care economy in the world, it has been women. Just as women have been carrying the load at home, fantastic feminist activists have been carrying the flag for the activism. We're not saying men should come and take that flag. We need to come and march alongside. Now, we often have the belief that men don't care about care policies, but depending on how we ask the questions, what matters to men, the differences between what matters to men and women in terms of what they need to sustain their families are really not that different. There's a slightly higher percentage of men who care about military and national security, 
But across the other, and women's rights, women certainly caring more about that. The other issues, health care, cost of living, access to health to care services for the elderly and for children, men care about this as much as women do. So the question becomes, why is it that voters, and particularly men voters, don't seem to be voting in this direction? That would be a long conversation. Um, but the point being, we need to look in and talk to men about the policies that also matter to them. We have been trying to make this message with places like, there is now a US Dads Congressional Caucus, 30 members of Congress, um, all fathers of young children, these points, these data points we've shared with them as well to say, if you frame this right, you can get votes for these policies, including with the elusive men that you're trying to get to vote in progressive ways in this country. So one of these things is that we asked as well, would you be willing to be, to do some kind of political activism for care work? The numbers for men and women are pretty equal. Um, so we think, again, this is something we can hold up to political leaders. And last time we checked, they do like to get votes. Um, that men will vote for this if we present it to them in inappropriate ways. The last argument I think we need to face in this world is the economic one. Um, I'm, I was just with a group of, act, of activists and researchers at the World Economic Forum Global Futures Council. One of those councils is on care. We are next to folks at the Global Council on Artificial Intelligence, on climate change, on the metaverse. And we're trying to explain to this group of lots of men in suits what the care economy was. It was interesting in, this, in the shared spaces when they said, what Global Futures Council are you on? And I said, on oh, the care economy. And there was a couple of reactions. One was, what the hell is that? Or there was that slow shuffle of like on the way to get a coffee. Of like, I hope he doesn't ask me anything else. So I, we've got a huge work to do to say, this is not instead of productive economy. Care workers are 11.5% of the global workforce. Care is about a quarter of GDP, depending on where you look. This is, I think what we'll often hear, well, compared to the productive economy, no, no, no. This is the productive economy. There is no way at a place like the World Economic Forum or IMF or the World Bank, other places where global um, and macroeconomic policies are made that you cannot think about your economy without thinking about care. Um, so our, we land on the point that this is not a technical issue. We've got lots of ideas of what can move the needle on men's participation. The issue is political. Are we willing to hold up the policies to hold the politicians accountable, to hold our workplaces accountable for the things that we know can move the needle on getting men to care about care. Thanks very much. And if um, if I were to parents, um, our amazing comms team has put together shoots and ladders here um, of those key points. Um, we did try to do more ladders to feel a bit more helpful. There are snakes there too. Those of you who know the childhood game, those of us who played this with our kids, I'll play it still. Um, so the key points are here. I'm looking for Jose, our comms director, Rebecca Ladbury, our PR, who supported on putting this together. So the points are here. Questions about the data to my colleague, Brian Heilman here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. And um, again, we need to see how can this report and the amazing work that Promondo is doing would inform policy, uh, programming, advocacy, and also decision-making around the world. So, and how can we, uh, all those of us in the room here come become partners for this and agents for this as well. Um, you need to hold young women accountable uh, to do more, given that we're the entity on gender equality. Now we would have the chance to uh, hear from Emmanuel Paramagi um, from Rwanda, uh, from the Rwanda's Men Resource Center on a transformative intervention that aims to engage men as partners and fathers in maternal, newborn, and child health. Um, violence prevention and caregiving for a healthier couple relationship. Uh, Emmanuel? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Today, 29th October, we are celebrating the International Day for Care and Support to raise awareness globally about the importance and value for care work, both paid and unpaid care work, and about the need to recognize, to reduce, and to redistribute the care work. 
One of the core aspects of Bande Berejo is to redistribute unpaid care work within the family precisely by engaging men in tasks traditionally attributed to women. We want men to care for their children as fathers and to be partners to their wives, not just by providing money, which is the way traditionally men express care, but also by being more involved in child care and in other domestic cores. Evidence from Bande Berejo clearly show that engaging men in unpaid care work and child care specifically is linked with the reduction of domestic violence, more equitable spousal relationships, better parenting, and with better health outcomes for everyone in the family. Even if society might label some of these men who cook, clean, change their children's partners as bewitched by their wives, they th themselves see such advantages in their life and they don't let their neighbors gossip prevent them from doing the right thing. Investing in engaging men in unpaid care work at scale is therefore an effective strategy to promote gender equality in the families and also across generations as male children who grow up seeing their fathers involved in it are more likely to do it once they grow up. Vandeviru is a gender transformative uh, intervention that is implemented by Rwanda Men's Resource Center, Rwamrek in short. It is implemented in Musanze district, but we started the pilot phase in 2013 up to 2015. And then we tested the scale up in 2019 up to 2022. And now we are scaling up the intervention in it three districts of Rwanda in collaboration with the Rwanda Biomedical Center, Ministry of Gender and Family Promotion, National Childhood Development Agent. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, again, the, the work on, uh, on the issue uh, is, is faced by a lot of uh, peer pressure and quote unquote bullying from uh, from society to to revert back to traditional uh, roles um, and and this is where I think the role of the civil society to continue to push and advocate and I come to you Huri uh, did I say it right Perfect. <laughs> um, your perspective being an an, an, uh, an active member of the uh, civic movement especially the feminist civic movement and being engaged with the CS, uh, NGO CSW in New York. Um, where do you see the importance of engaging men and boys on uh, the empowerment uh, agenda and, and how would this affect change? Can you hear me? Yeah. Or should I make it close? Okay. Well, short answer everywhere. <laughs> but I would love to elaborate, first of all, Gary's report is so spot on. He basically took all my talking points, but I know I can talk a lot more, so I'll just dive right in. It's, it's so important to have a tool like this, as you, Muhammad, mentioned that this is this can be a really important tool for us to bring to our circles, to our activism, and to also our own personal beliefs and evolution. Um, I'll start by saying um, I come from a very traditional background. I was an immigrant in New York City with a husband who said, oh, you don't have to work. I'll take care of you. And within six months, we knew I had to work. And I started helping with the business. And of course, it improved our lives tremendously. I was lucky enough to be able to um, uh, you know, postpone having children until we were stable. So, I mean, I know personally how important it is to make this individual and universal. So I want to really take that in saying the first time I, re I realized that I was taking on a lot more care in the family was when my oldest son was learning the universal Dec declaration in maybe middle school or high school. I don't know. So it took me a while. And one of them said the right to leisure or something like that. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> 
I didn't know for this. <laughs> I mean, not that I was suffering so much. I don't want to paint a dire picture here, but just the idea. And of course, my kids used it for homework <laughs> reasons. But I, I, you know, the conversation started about how we each had to contribute to the world that we were living in. Um, and it's never going to be equal. Let's face it. I mean, you know, as someone who's been working with the gender equality realm with the NGO Committee on Status of Women, working directly with the Commission on the Status of Women, we know how hard it is to gain one or two steps and then step back and take a deep breath and say, okay, let's go one more time. So I think it's very important to not give up. And I love, again, having the data and I love having um, the breakdown of not only cultural, but also at all levels, right? Um, and, and the thing that I really wanna plug in here really quickly is the, the about, about all genders. You can be a single man, you can be a trans, you can be gay, married, um, you're going to have the same issues. You know, lesbians are going to have the same issues. Homosexuals are going to have the same issues. So I think it's so important. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to br bring up the un universal human rights, because at the end of the day, it is a human right. And it's one of the things that I've learned after, again, 12 years of fighting for our gender equality, is that it has to be all individuals have to make the decision on what is it that I need? And how can I improve this world? Another example I just wanted to use was how the world le learned that by women going out to work, it improved family life, right? So, okay. And then we did both then, right? Now I think we're shifting into the idea of, yes, men have to work and men have to get the pleasure, not the chore. That's one of the things I think you also mentioned, and I'm glad that you have that in your data, where men see it as, oh, I have to go home and work. I have to really, you know, well, we've been doing that. It's it's your child or it's your choice to, to care for your mother. I mean, I want to go back to what Muhammad said, too. Again, it's not just for the children. It's really caring for each other um, in any kind of relationship. And and I think it really will help us as humans, again, to understand what this is like. And my ultimate goal, I really don't want to talk too much because I kept saying, like, I, I love the idea of the fireside chat because we all bring such different perspectives. But my ultimate goal, as people know who have worked with me, is really to reduce violence, violence against women, gender-based violence, and violence in that global level, right? you know, the demilitarize. Why do we need weapons? If men really understood the beautiful care of children and animals too. I mean, I know maybe we should approach men with like, do you love dogs and cats? <laughs> it doesn't that make you feel great? <laughs> you know, just imagine the satisfaction you get when you really care for someone and the reward you receive and maybe they'll create less bombs and hit, you know, and and create havoc in this world. Sorry, I have to go there. <laughs> so, and the last thing I wanted to say, I just want to make sure, but I guess that we have a chance to also chat later, and I'll bring it up. But I do like the men being the action members of change, right? And with NGO CSW for the um, years that we've worked. I have tried so hard, and my team, because it's never an I with NGO CSW, by the way, it's the collaborative, transparent, shared leadership model, just in case you didn't know that. And it really applies to this too, right? Um, with the home care, for example. But I think, you know, it's been so hard to really get men and boys involved in the fight that we do. And I know you and women, our partner on this side of the street, um, has done tremendous work in that with the he for she and you know we try to mimic that and do other things and it's just so difficult and I'm so grateful there's so many men here really working in this field because it's hard to get men to understand the pleasure and the and and the reward that you receive in improving this world and not destroying it so um, and the last thing I'll say is that my firstborn child who taught me about the universal, he is now a father. And I just 
love watching him make choices in his career that will put him at home more to care for his twin boys. Yes, I have three sons and twin grandsons, all feminists, I have to say. <laughs> but, you know, and again, it's, that's my point. It has to go from the local to the global. My work at the global level means nothing if I'm not bringing it to my community, to my family, and vice versa. So maybe I'll just stop there and then um, we can discuss it further later. Thank you, uh, Hilary. And uh, in indeed, we need to go from the local to the global. And uh, as you both, you and, and Gary said, it's, it's very political. And when toxic masculinities um, polarize the world, we, we need to continue to push uh, forward, not only push back, but also push forward. Um, I agree with you, the issues are the same uh, for all of us, Corey, but unfortunately, some have it more difficult than others. And, uh, and this is where we want to, to push forward. Now we're uh, fortunate to, uh, to have um, uh, Delfina uh, Shinon, uh, who uh, is from the Latin American team for gender and justice. I'm not going to slaughter the name in Spanish again. She um, shared a video on their experience leveraging uh, research to influence decision makers and affect public policy in their country. So let us listen to that. En Argentina, la licencia de paternidad dura solamente dos días y con tan poco tiempo es muy difícil poder establecer vínculos afectivos entre los padres y los hijos, poder tener una presencia activa en la crianza y en la corresponsabilidad de las tareas de cuidado y también poder aportar de esa manera al desarrollo infantil. Para poder seguir impulsando mejores políticas públicas, nos parecía fundamental conocer qué piensan las y los argentinos. En la encuesta eh, local del State of the World's Fathers del 2023 nos permitió obtener esa información que nos faltaba en Argentina y lo que pudimos constatar es que hay una gran distancia entre lo que la gente piensa y lo que tenemos en la realidad. Porque lo que vemos es que el 95% de las personas encuestadas considera que es fundamental que los padres tengan una presencia activa en la crianza de sus hijos. Sin embargo, nuestra normativa, como les decíamos antes, obstaculiza en gran medida que eso suceda. Según los datos de la encuesta, 8 de cada 10 personas encuestadas considera que las licencias de paternidad tienen que ser más extendidas para que los padres puedan participar de manera más activa en las tareas de cuidado y crianza de sus hijos, ya sean recién nacidos o adoptados. Eh, y también lo que vimos es que 7 de cada 10 personas encuestadas considera que esa licencia de paternidad tiene que ser de al menos 30 días. En ELA tomamos los resultados de la encuesta, realizamos un informe y también una infografía que nos permitió distribuir ese material y esos resultados con legisladoras y legisladores nacionales que hoy en día están discutiendo la reforma del esquema de licencias que tenemos. Eh, así que pudimos hacer incidencia legislativa con este material tan importante. También aprovechamos que estamos en un año electoral y compartimos esta información con los distintos equipos de campaña y las y los candidatos presidenciales con la intención de que puedan incorporar eh, el eje de cuidados y en particular la reforma de las licencias dentro de las propuestas de campaña o al menos considerar la posibilidad de realizar esta reforma tan necesaria en el próximo gobierno. Y por último, hicimos un gran trabajo de difusión y de divulgación de los resultados a través de campañas de comunicación en el marco del Día del Padre que es en junio en Argentina, estuvimos difundiendo una campaña que llamamos Recuerdo de mi licencia de paternidad y fue una campaña que estuvimos difundiendo en la vía pública, en nuestras redes sociales eh, y en distintos medios de comunicación y sí tuvimos mucha repercusión eh, con esa campaña porque lo que hicimos fue poder evidenciar nuevamente que solamente tenemos esos dos días y además contar con distintos testimonios de padres que han contado con distintas licencias y distintas experiencias. En definitiva lo que vimos es que los datos de esta encuesta nos permitieron constatar que en Argentina hay un consenso social sobre la necesidad de avanzar y mejorar las licencias que tenemos en pos de acceder al derecho a cuidar y a recibir cuidados porque este es un derecho tanto de los padres y de las madres a cuidar pero también de sus hijos e hijas a recibir cuidados en condiciones de igualdad. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, thank you, Delfina, again, uh, the importance of statistics and numbers and, and scientific research to uh, to advocate for change in policies. What is it in it for for the other, uh, for them to change? Um, now to you, Chris. Um, uh, Chris Curtis from the High Commissioner for Human Rights Office. Um, you will uh, share some reflections on the intersection between gender, stereotypes, human rights, uh, masculinities. So, please. Thanks a lot for the invitation and thanks for the report to Equity Monda and, and Young Women. I think the conversation is leading in, in a nice way without pre disagreement. It, it <laughs> like lots of thanks a lot, Uri, also to bring the issue of, of human rights there. I think short time. So, first point is. Uh, the obligation to eradicate stereotypes and to promote the equal sharing of care uh, between men and women is not only a moral obligation, but it's a legal obligation. So it's firmly enshrined in CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which is a binding human rights treaty. Uh, so Article 5 of, uh, of, of the Convention requires state party to take all appropriate measures to modify the social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women with a view to achieving the elimination of prejudices and customary and all other practices which are based on the idea of inferiority or superiority of either of their sexes or on stereotype roles for men and women. And the same CEDA in Article 5b and 11 reaffirms the idea of the shared responsibility on the upbringing of children and, and care work. And this idea has been reaffirmed by political commitments. Uh, I mean, two major ones is the Beijing Declaration and Bradford Convention, and many references on this, with specific actions to be taken, and also SDG uh, Target 5.4 in the uh, our com in 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 the uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, speaks about the recognition of the value of unfair care work and domestic work through the provision of public services, infrastructure, and social protection policies. And, and the promotion of shared responsibility to the, the household and the family as nationally appropriate. So, so this is not a sarah, but a nice role, and I think about which will be part has been uh, committed by states, both in legal, legally binding instruments and also in political instruments that reaffirm that. So, so a couple, couple of things. things. Second point, which are the gender stereotypes we, we, we need to tackle? I think uh, that brings the idea of masculinity. This goes both ways. One is the idea that women are made to be mothers, and this is a natural, natural uh, uh, desire to, uh, to be mothers. And second, that uh, women are naturally to, to be the main uh, areas of, of care work. Uh, and I mean, reversing that, that the, just going to bring it closer. Reversely, the stereotype is, is that men are either not naturally gifted or they don't know or they are incapable of dealing with issues with regard to care. So these are lived gender stereotypes that see out the Beijing track and the Beijing is to tap. Uh, uh, and, and I think part of, of the issue of is the how it's devised uh, different, different uh, approaches. approaches. So I think of uh, target, target 5.4 5. 5. of, of the SDGs. Already says the three different ways that need to be explored. So one, the idea of economic committee value and paid care work. Uh, so we have already have some estimations, but we still need to devise measures uh, to understand how you, we translate that economically. Is it subsidies? Is it tax exemptions? Is it uh, so that that's one big area. So the second one is the provision of services that. Uh, and burden or lessen the burden of, of women on Cape Bear. Uh, living in New York, one can see that daycare in New York is as expensive as rent. So mm -hmm. it's absolutely so. I mean, this is an area where public provision of public services of such subsidies of privately provided services is needed as a public policy. And the third one is the area where we're working is the promotion of the idea that there should be shared responsibilities between, between men and women. Uh, parental is one, it's a legal measure, but um, as Gary said, it, uh, uh, that was good also to be my, my point. There's many countries where this is a legal provision, but it's not practiced because of yeah. social norms. So the idea of changing stereotypes goes directly to, to the idea of changing lived social norms uh, that are not strictly mandatory by the law, but 
is a way in which people uh, understand their role and their expectations in, in society. So I think for this we need carrot stick, uh, carrot and uh, sticks and, and carrots. So some mandatory uh, measures, but also the idea of obligations that tap on sensitizing the men and women, uh, and that means. The nature of these obligations is not only vertical, so it's not only state imposing through education, but also engaging with the, the uh, factories of social imagination, uh, including media. So I think media, you also mentioned, media has a major role in projecting the idea that these gender stereotypes are not only detrimental for men, but for, me, for women, but also for men, and the different perspectives on how to envisage a shared role of men and women in the in care work should be pro projected. So I think uh, sticks and carrots here it also means the need to find good practices coming from I mean, the idea of a, a global campaign is, is important to, uh, to bring good examples from, from different places. Uh, I think I mean the, the idea of storytelling, the idea of narratives is, is very important on this because people socialize themselves not only by the law but basically through social interaction and media has a, a central role on that. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop here. I have some more, perhaps more legal jargon there on, mm -hmm. on the nature of, of the obligations, but I think that puts on, on the table the fact that one, these are legal obligations. Second, that there's space to experiment on this. So on, on these three different uh, ways, we, we, we there's space for innovation. We don't have one fits all, uh, one size fits all solutions, and we, we need to try the solutions, particularly taking into consideration the variety of social and, tra and social traditions and cultures. So engaging in the local context on the basis of universal values is, is very important. To us. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. No, thank you, Chris. And, and maybe you can, you can also tell us a bit more about uh, the, the nature of these uh, legal obligations and, and measures, uh, the, the stick side of it. Of things okay. to, to tell us more about the stick. So, one interesting thing is the way in which these obligations are framed is an open way. Uh, so, the, pre the first obligation, the, the legal obligation of the state, uh, serves not to incur in gender stereotyping. And the, the, there are some good examples coming from from CEDA, for example, there's a number of case law under the optional protocol of CEDA on gender stereotypes in judicial venue, in, in, in judicial decisions. Uh, so how gender stereotypes play a role in adjudicating rape cases, uh, labor cases, and, and other cases. Uh, but I think the main elimination has is directed to social relations, not only to the relations between state and and and, and, individual. and on that. Uh, I think that the first issue is one directly thinks of, of in, in other issues, violence against women, the first things about what using criminal law, using sanctions, etc. I think that's particularly not the, the way to start. The, the way to start is more the awareness raising, uh, uh, sensitization, sensitization, and, and education, and engaging with, 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 with different actors. There's an upcoming general, recommend, general recommendations are documents issued by the Treaty Voice, but by the committee, CEDA will prepare a general recommendation on gender stereotypes uh, starting next year. There will be a, a day of open discussion on, on the issue, and, and we, we can expect that general recommendation to come up in uh, 2025. So there would be also space there for inputs from civil society organizations and different organizations uh, to identify some of the stereotypes. And I think there's good space to work on, on this one. On, the, the nature, the nature of the uh, imposition of motherhood and care responsibilities only on, on women and, and, and to deconstruct that one. So I think that, that, that that's an interesting. And second, I think uh, the idea that these this legal obligations include the idea of a public policies that are directed to this. So you, you need to state the goals in, in domestic legislation, but also try them. So I, I think on, on this, we still have Lots of space to explore with which other things. We know some, so we, we, we know that there should be a stronger uh, uh, state provision or state subsidy of daycare, for example, that, 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 that's a fact, and there's a big gap on that. 
we need about we we know that we need to extend parental uh, leave. Uh, the little caveat there is that works particularly when the labor workforce is formal, but doesn't work where half of the labor force is informal. So that only and that usually that that means that that only benefits uh, workers that are integrated through the formal workforce, which are usually aristocracy workers. Most of the work, the poor people are. And I think that another issue regarding social class, which is many of these uh, of, of these measures might benefit upper middle class with professional women that then outsource other women that are, are the paid care workers, which are usually migrant women. So that's another angle we need to tackle. So they're not to benefit only the, the women that, of, of, of course, are victims of inequality, but are in a slightly more comfortable position because they can choose to work or be professionals, etc. So the gender plus class issue is also an important issue. The intersectionality is of it, and of course there is a, um, a huge gap between the legal obligations that come in CEDU and the other uh, treaties and the application on the ground. So, for example, Afghanistan has signed CEDU, mm -hmm. um, and now we're, uh, we're in a totally different place, so how can we work on this? Last but not least, uh, to you, Shobo, uh, Shobo Jalal uh, from UNICEF, uh, maybe uh, to reflect and, and uh, join us in um, the reflections on how um, creating positive norms um, around masculinities at an early stage um, can be beneficial to society, but also the intersection of child's rights and uh, gender equality and transformative change. Um, to you, Shobo. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I wanted to start also by echoing my colleagues in congratulating you on this uh, piece of work because it is definitely going to benefit all of us uh, in our work and in advocacy all um, in all agencies all who, are, who all who care need this care right so uh, this kind of advocacy are really important and I also congratulate the colleagues uh, online who shared their excellent uh, examples at the country level which tells us that change can happen. And that's something that those examples of work are something that we could really build on on that one. Going back to your question about early start is really an important, like science saying that the social cognitive development of children is at the three years of three, where the child begins to sense the identity and it stabilizes at five and it continues in adolescence. So early start is really an important aspect. And evidence tells us that when you start early with that, the change is much easier to do when you start by changing adults. And you, given the nature of this work and the long-term need of the intervention, it is important that we start with the new generation and make that environment in front of us, the future, better for those uh, coming children. So definitely uh, starting at early stages is an important factor that we uh, we need to be uh, focusing on. Uh, and that's how UNICEF is actually looking into the parenting program in a way that, uh, that focuses on uh, this particular group. And we do have our parenting strategy that covers the life course in childhood and in adolescent programming. And I wanted to say that social protection is actually one of the goal areas in UNICEF strategic plan. And, and that's an important area because we feel like those policies, those social protection programs and need to be aligned to address the rights and disadvantage and vulnerabilities of children and women. And that's why it is a key priority. And for this the strategic plan that UNICEF has actually, gender responsive social protection is one of the five goal areas. So it's at the big high level of the organization. And, and we're really proud that with our advocacy that we have started at countries within the last two years, we almost doubled the number of countries who actually do programming on gender responsive social protection programs across the globe. I wanted to come to a question where unpacking the toxic masculinities. And if we want to walk into that direction, I think it's really important we focus on 
And thanks to my colleagues, many of them have been mentioned already, but I just wanted to put them in. Share care responsibility. That's number one. And in order to do that, it's the norm that you were referring to. It's the policies. If you do not have policies that enable a mother to work, then you are not giving that chance to be to have the shared responsibility. If you are not giving a, a mother who works a, um, a, a parental leave, if you don't give her a leave to go and vaccinate her child, if you don't give her, if you don't give the father a leave to go and vaccinate the child, so the shared responsibility is not an individual only. It's a collective action that we need to look at it through all the social ecological model, from the policies, from the services, from the actual service provider and all of that. So shared responsibility is one of the things. If a child is raised in an environment where the father, like we saw in Rwanda, the father is caring for the feeding of the child, even if it is breastfeeding, even if it is what is feeding, if the child is raised in that, that's the generation we are looking for. If the child is raised in a house where the father is also cooking, is also ironing, is also caring for the sick people, then that's the generation we are looking for. So that's the vision that we have by focusing on early life. We need to do that. The second component, in my view, when we are going to talk about the, uh, uh, the toxic masculinities that you asked for, is the roles within the house. Who decides? Who has access to the resources? Yeah, this is all important. Is it like cut in stone that the father has to bring the money and the mother has to care for that? That kind of norm that we need to address. And in order for us to change that norm, it's not only the individuals. I know that the obligation that you referred in the CDAO, that Article 5, that they need to do the cultural programs. Not most of these programs are actually funded by the government. And you keep on relying on the good work that civil society is doing, but it is not enough. We need to back that with the policies that we need to kind of. And it is really important when we talk about who's the breadwinner and who's for the caregiver, it's really important. I want to give an example, actually, in, in, uh, in Mozambique. And where even when the father went to go and get the child for vaccination, the community are actually staring at him and saying, oh, you're doing this, this is not your job. So it's even if there is a willingness inside, you need to work at the community. And here comes the media. You need to have that comprehensive campaign to ensure and address that so that father can go. And this is the, the example that we are doing is the family model in Mozambique. So it starts with immunization, but it's, it builds the wider gender equality the third component that I wanted to is the non-discriminatory rearing practices. So you prefer your son? Is it more favorable for son to go for education rather than the, the girl? Is it the cutting the girl at the beginning that discrimination that you want to do? So these are some of the non-discriminatory practices that we need to know. And, and I think UNICEF is really good in terms of the social protection and uh, social uh, 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 social behavioral change programs that work at community level to work around that one. And the final component, in my view, where I think we need to kind of look, and I think everybody's working on that, but it's still not fun, is the nonviolent environment. This is it. Everything tells us children who have just been to, to violence at their early stages, they already become violent themselves at their future. Mothers who are subjected to violence, they become violent at their future. And so it is really an important aspect that we look into a non-violent environment, which promotes an environment for children to, to be raised in a way that will address these kind of issues. Um, uh, moving forward in the future uh, work is something that we can do. So I, I just wanted to unpack the, to the toxic masculinities that we are talking about. And then I want to raise that message which uh, you brought in, Mohammed, which was that we need to work collectively. It is not only UNICEF, it is not only civil society. Everybody needs to have that accountability. And I wanted to enforce that message. Um, right now at UNICEF, 
we have several things apart from our strategic plan, our apart, apart from our gender action plan. We do have an adolescent strategy coming up. We are rolling up adolescent strategy in more than 36 countries globally. And here we are talking about agency decision making and along with the protection, education, and uh, health and nutrition. So this is a new strategy that we are rolling out. And I think this individual building skills is an important aspect if we are going into the direction where the girls themselves will demand. I think you brought in the, how, to, how can we create the demand? The girls themselves, the families accept the technology for the girls, accept that girls into that direction, accept girls work in, in fields where they were not working before, and hence changing the norms around acceptance of the role of the girls and in the future. That's another thing that we are uh, trying to cover at this stage. And I wanted also to reflect on uh, a work that is just started. UNICEF is starting to work on um, universal policy benchmarks for parenting program, where we're trying to pilot this in some countries and learn from the lessons which kind of brings the accountability and the legal obligation to another level at the implementation and operational uh, operational aspect. So um, several areas that UNICEF is working on. I really want to kind of congratulate everything that we are doing, all of us here. And really, that's a, a, a point that we need to take out of this meeting with all of you. I wanted to end with the question, actually. Sorry if I take some more time. And it's based on what Gary said. And you said men do care. Yeah. And I want to ask the question, do men care or should we say men are accountable to care? Mm -hmm. So it's not willingness, but it's the accountability that I want to promote. And through you, I would like to pass this message. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Shobo. And, and actually, uh, Shobo did not boast about UNICEF. Uh, and I have to say here that UNICEF has been the leading agency in the UN on parental leave uh, policy. So it's uh, until now the most generous uh, UN organization when it comes to um, uh, giving the, the, the staff uh, maternity yeah. and paternity yeah. leave. Um, you, you, you've raised so many important issues. Shobu, one of them uh, is definitely about the politics and the politicking around the implementation and, and the, of, of these policies. I, I remember when we were uh, trying to change curriculum in, in, uh, in countries, education curriculum, where you have sentences like, my father goes to the field to work, my mother stays at home to cook, or I play soccer with my friends and my sister stays at home to help my mother and you get the political level um, giving the green light to change whether it was the minister or uh, the cabinet of ministers you go all the way down to those who are actually changing the curriculum and this is where you get the resistance those do not want to change and here is the work not only the, the vertical, but the horizontal on the advocacy and the media and the socializing of norms across all the levels. We're, uh, we're uh, over with our panel. Uh, now we have the, the room to, to hear from all of us uh, here in the room, but also online. Um, questions, uh, reflections, uh, contributions. And maybe uh, we start with one of our partners of Prime, as you mentioned before, Brian. Uh, Brian Heilman is one of the co-authors of um, the um, State of the World uh, Fathers Report and Deputy Director of Research at Equimondo. Uh, Brian. Sure. Thank you so much. This and this, how are you going to manage, Sean? Yeah. Because we, you have the thing here. We have a very sophisticated system, right? You have the mic for, you have the mic for the room, and then you have the laptop for those who are not with us here in the room. So, okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Very so I mean, just a few ideas. It's really my pleasure to be here, and thank you to the panelists. I wanted to make sure to inform everyone about the global men care campaign. 
uh, this could be found both on the Equilino website and also at n-care.org. And each of us individually or our organizations can sign up and take the men care commitment through that website, <laughs> which says that we're gonna actually follow through on the ideas that we're sharing here. And to Hori's point, if you go to the men care website now, you'll see me having signed up as a someone making that commitment with my cat sitting on my lap. So <laughs> yes, that can be part of the care. Um, the, the finding that really I want to emphasize the most in this particular edition of the State of the World's Fathers is about the linkages and overlaps of all kinds of care. So we use fatherhood and childcare as an entry point, but in fact, we found that more respondents in our study told us they were doing four different kinds of care, child care, elder care, partner care, care for persons with disabilities, then told us they were just doing child care alone. And this is also the first edition where we asked folks about care for their neighbors, volunteering in their community, care for the planet, and the environment. So if you're interested in all the ways that care overlaps um, and beyond child care, the report is strong. I uh, really need to lift up that there are 17 countries of data in this report, and that is precisely because we had 17 amazing country partners leading that work. So really, it's a collective of hundreds, thousands working on this, and I want to make sure uh, we give credit to all of the country partners of MedCare who worked on this. And finally, even though, yes, I'm the one who uh, crunches all the numbers and makes the charts, and and I'll all the data, it also just speaks to me that inside all of those numbers and statistics are each of our individual stories. And I, I hope that in this study and in future editions, we can all think about and do really well to articulate how do we actually negotiate and achieve something called care equality? What does that look like in real terms? How do you wake up in the morning and decide you know what, I actually have a little bit more energy to me today. I'm going to take on a little bit more than I did yesterday. And how can I share that with my partner? How can I say, honey, you made this amazing dinner. I'm going to clean up all the dishes and do all the cleaning. What, what are the actual conversations, words we use, stories, examples of how we live equality? And I feel like that's going to look actually different from family to family, person to person. And if we get a little bit more of the beauty of each human um, relationship above and beyond the, the counting of numbers and hours, I think is going to really help our movement. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Brian. How, how do we live um, equality? I, I think that's, that's something that we need to, uh, to take um, away from this room today. How do we live it? How do we tailor it for, for us? Uh, in, in any family unit we have. Um, now we turn to uh, uh, Amir uh, Dosal, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Global Partnerships Forum. I knew of Amir before I meet Amir uh, when he was a senior official in the UN Department for Social and Economic Affairs, DESA. From his uh, younger colleagues at the time who ended up being senior officials in in the un and in un women some of them uh, are are women colleagues and their tribute to amir they said that we would not have made it here if it wasn't for some amir's uh, support and and encouragement and belief in us and giving us the room to take opportunities think out of the box make mistakes and he was supportive of all of, all of us on this, uh, and I quote here, uh, my former colleague who just retired, uh, Donna Grimway, who was the Deputy Director of Management and Administration and the Director of Finance in UN Women, and that was her words of tribute to Amir. So Amir, to you. Thank you. I deserve this. I might, I just want to say, I'm sorry. One of the best things that happened to me in my career was that virtually all of my courses were women, right from my early days, even in the UN. I, I, I worked as Deputy Secretary General, but when I started first, I was a senior woman, I had 20 people who recruited me, and then 
the dandelion. She said, I'm going to the first. And I said, oh my God. <laughs> no proof that I'm going to be So I agreed with that. And I'll be in touch with that and give her a briefing what happened. But all the years, I had kids and became quite sick. I said, my speaking doesn't get it. And I'm going to be a little controversial. I don't think the women need to shout and scream. The women need to recruit the men to be chaplains. Because we should say, say, how can we address this? And I think we will have a report that's some very good ideas and that they can actually go for. We share our workload, but we care for ourselves, we care for our children, and families. That's very important. I sat down with the UN, said I'm going to recruit 50% women, we've done that. It goes back to the days of Kofi Annan. But I also I have member states come to me and say, we don't get it. Why are you trying to push, push the gender equality agenda? It doesn't work in our culture. They must be. It can clear us in a diplomatic way. And I've said, you know, it's not, they're not trying to tell you that you should do particular things. You should recognize that men have a role to play, and they should extend that role to help you. Because women are seeing your position. We also have to go somewhere else. And they also look after their spouses. There are three roles. And men have to stand in one role. And they pretend to say we're breadwinner. But actually, life occurs because of your spouse, because of the uh, spouse you have in the household. So, I, what I'm saying is recruit champions from men, get them to the position. The Captain of the South African country football. He's an SP advocate. And he's launched a campaign with his wife on violence against women. Women have to launch that campaign. Men should be there. Men should walk out and say, we should do it. And we should change. And it should come from within. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amir. And, and uh, we, we have uh, many on uh, online and uh, here in the room, whoever wants to come forward with uh, questions or reflections, contributions, as long as these questions are not to me. So, uh, <laughs> please, uh, and if you may introduce yourself first and then uh, you can come forward. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Blessed Aina Nishnipan, the founder and CEO of Women for Life. Um, in fact, we had a summit yesterday um, called the Care at Work Summit um, because we believe that actually, in order to have these conversations with men, it needs to be a workplace. Um, that is the only place where men feel like they have power and feel like you know, they can listen. And so one of the things that we've always said is how do we tie this, you know, world of work to the world of care um, so that men are able to step into care um, in a way that isn't confronting. I have a, I have a son myself, they're four kids, and a lot of time it's hard, right, to get men to see the link between care and, you know, the household and, of course, the different outcomes, right? Um, because in fact, we've seen that men who step into care are better leaders. <laughs> they are more compassionate. They're able to nurture and lead the workplace. Um, and so for us, um, and I think for this panel, is how do we take that conversation, right? I'd love to speak with you, Gary, uh, offline, but how do we get, how do we go into the workplaces and really, you know, um, start this conversation, whether it's a campaign or a Tie some of the care objectives to business objectives. So, um, one for, uh, an example is I, I was chatting with the CEO of Indeed, and I said, Well, how do we tie care into performance um, or into how we, how we um, conduct performance reviews, right? Because a lot of managers, men that are men, are not even able to have conversations with their reports that are going up to say, It's okay. Like, 
you can take that gender neutral brand of leave and please take it all because we want you to come back truly refreshed, feeling like you have contributed to your most important organization, which is your home. And so, you know, I think there's, there has to be a better way for us to leave the workplace um, to care. Yes, there's a lot of political correctness around this, yet in application, yes, indeed, you have a lot of managers, including some of us in the UN, roll up their eyes when the, they, when the, when the staff come and ask for paternal, uh, paternity leave and, and they take the full, uh, the full extent of it. So I think we need to start working on ourselves <laughs> before we move and, and on and, and work uh, with others. Um, please also please um, uh, introduce yourself and then we will move online. Thank you. My name is Arthur Manchina and I am Chicago. Uh, I want to, I want to hear what you think if you are paying attention to an issue that is uh, has been more present in the literature recently. It's the crisis that the growing of between men and women has produced on men. In particular, young men. Happens that the last 70 years we have had a tremendous mobility upwards. And men have been from stagnant to going downward. And that is particularly true in the educational system. So girls are graduating from high school at much higher proportion from college now to much higher proportion. And, um, and if the, the change in education has brought into change in income. So many men are saying, who am I? I was a provider, now she is the provider. Uh, what is my value? Uh, this has been a uh, dramatic consequences in certain areas. So I think that is great, of course, that men care, but we are at the point that we men need to be taken care of, in particular, young men. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can we take another question before we, we come to the panel? Maybe this time from, okay, one more from the room and then we go online. Thank you, Hi, everyone. I'm Jana Marlowe-Turner. I'm a strategist, a communications person, stakeholder relations, and I also sit on the board of Calls and Men, which is a national organization focused on healthy masculinity and the collective sense of the boys. Um, I'm glad that this is like how this person just brought that out because I think a lot about men's mental health, and I think a lot about um, that also in order to affect behavior change, men have to understand and I think the fact that patriarchy is violence against men too is incredibly important that we talk about. Um, I think also, you know, to also name the villain that we are up against, which is, this is not my original term, but the global brotherhood of misogyny is a good guessing line. We don't have to be on a tax chain together and get in formation to stop this that's going on happening. If we can let to work. Um, so I think that's one thing that's really important. And when I think about men's mental health, I think also about the fact that um, you all may know the statistics better than I do, but that something like 78% of suicides in our country are um, middle-aged white men who, as we know, predominantly run all of our financial, government, social, and cultural institutions. And that, I think, is sometimes even as a private health crisis, which is a public health crisis, because it wreaks havoc that those men having the tools to process what is going on in the world right now, I just turned over his head, is so crucial to them. Otherwise, that can go somewhere and it's manifestly violence against the world as well as violence against himself. So um, I just, I'm, I'm curious how we can talk about it to the extent that. Um, Everyone here has said that the answer lies with men, right? If women could end violence against women, if women could end this, we would have had a very, very, very long time ago. Um, and so we 
think about the only way that people really change their behavior is when they realize what's in it for them. And um, Gary, some of your incredible research talked about, and we've talked to you here about like, how much it helps from the benefit to men and how the um, cascade impact it has on women's well being and sense of self. Um, so I just I wanted to flag men's mental health as being an underpinning of this. We also were talking about a four letter word, which is care. And like one of the first things if you go to your doctor and they want to treat you for depression, they'll say, Are you feeling despondent? Do you care? <laughs> right? And here we are, like men are saying we do care, like that there's a distance. So I think this really underpins all of it. Um just wanted to say that. Thank you so much. Maybe we uh, can turn to the panel and then we'll take another round of reflections and questions. Uh, who would like to start? Shall I give you the floor? Sure. Are you sure? No, there's somebody else. Do you want to take one on one? Should we do one on one? One. We will take one we will okay. the round to, to do it okay. online. Yes. Um, yeah, I want to comment on the. I think the last or two of your comment and your comments around how do we situate this within kind of men's well-being as well. And one one of the data points that um, we didn't share from the study, but we think is important, is that when men take greater emotional self-care, that is, they are aware of when they need help and support from others, they tend to do more care for others. Um, and we think that also works by in bi-directional ways. If we care about men and men's well-being. They tend to also be able to come up and do the care that they want to do for others. We've tried to step into this conversation with an and. This is not going to work. That it is, um, that it is possible to say we do need, and I take, take your point about, we need to hold, particularly men who hold power, we need to hold you accountable for inequality, for harm. Um, while at the same time, we believe we can do that with deep compassion for how ideas about masculinity, what do we want to call this, misogyny, patriarchy, the man box, as some colleagues call it, um, causes harm for men too. And that is not to say instead of, that is not to decenter where women are experiencing the harms of patriarchy for years and centuries, but to say these are connected. Um, and so that end is what we try to work on. So we can care deeply about men's mental health and we must, because the men who commit suicide, it's usually women who pick up the pieces. Men's average life expectancy is five years shorter than women's. About one year of that is probably biology. The rest of that is social. It is how we make men's lives. It's also about poverty, the kind of work you have to do. It is, and it is women who pay the price for that early death by men. It is usually women doing the care work that picks up in households when men pass early or have um, health consequences throughout their lives. So we've tried to step into this men care, both affirming that men should care and I liked your point again about accountability, as well as saying it's okay for us to care about men because that's where we get these kind of virtuous cycles of what we think can be the equality that we're after. Um, so really glad to, what, and, and maybe I'll make a point about our colleagues um, in the intervention in Rwanda. Um, what they didn't share is that we've been doing a randomized control trial. That's the you know, kind of most rigorous version of impact evaluation. After the work on this initiative with the rigorous impact evaluation, the men who participate in that parent training both take better self-care, they are doing more care at home, they are less likely to use violence against their partner compared to the control group that didn't go through these activities. It is pretty obvious, but to say when we do all those things together, there's a it, it pays forward in multiple ways. Also important to notice, women reported less stress, both parents reported less violence against children, um, so I think I, I offer that just to say how we see these issues as as connected. Um, and if you look closely at the video, the interesting issue there is men were smiling. There's like the it, you and you cannot fake that. Um, they are they are getting you know boosts of um, hormone fulfillment by being nurturing caregivers. And I think it's okay to say that we as men benefit when that happens. And I, I think that's where we see a pathway. To the change. Um, sorry, that was probably longer than I needed to go on about, but I think it was a, it was an excellent point that the two of you made uh, tonight. Or tonight. Reflections from the panel. 
Um, what I wanted to add is is when we talked about toxic uh, masculinities, it actually benefit men as well and boys as well. Because when we're talking about shared responsibility, I want to give an example. There was a study that UNICEF did in one of the countries, and actually the parents were negotiating with the mediator for their son to migrate. That's the pressure on the son to migrate. That's a role that that family has actually put for that. And the same thing for you have to be the breadwinner. No, you don't have to be. It can be shared. It can be a responsibility. So I think in terms of focusing on early life and focusing on toxic masculinities, there will be benefit for boys and girls. And of course, in the future, we're talking about men and women as well. Right now, I do take the point that um, there is a lot of dropouts in among boys. We do have that in some of the African countries right now. Maybe they want to kind of migrate or they don't see the value of the education at this stage. We are in an education crisis right now. At this stage, we are in an education crisis where the outcome of education doesn't fulfill the needs of neither the, the employer nor the, the, the graduate themselves. So there are several issues around that. So I would say let's work on both. So let's not ignore and let's not say that there is a tremendous progress for women because there is a chronic disadvantage for women, if I wanted to say that. But I do take care and we do need to need to look into a, an environment where the men also are uh, uh, exercising uh, well-being and mental health that enable them to support that care. So I think it's a win-win for everybody if we focus on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and maybe now we turn to online, uh, Leila or Marie, who would, uh, would you help us uh, reading some of the questions? Oh, the, 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 okay, perfect. Uh, we've got Lewis Archambault from FAO. He asks, is it possible to establish a link between longer maternity leave and more equal involvement of men and women in unpaid care work? And he had to apologize to leave early because yes. he went to pick up his daughter. Um, <laughs> but I said that we definitely asked the question. Absolutely. <laughs> Shall I ask one yeah. more? Okay. So Carla Cordova from NGO CSW New York. How the report presents? How does the report present or engage with communities that have rigid roles about care work? And one more. Yep. Maria Matthew, we need to look at upstream solutions to the under valuation, lack of recognition for the care work that is disproportionately carried by women. One important point that, unlike paid care work, unpaid care work done by caregivers are not counted within the production boundary of systems of national accounts. Are there advocacy efforts to push for recognising women's labour within this system? How can we push for this? Like to start. I mean, picking back on, on some of the points, Arturo, I mean, clearly there has been an increase in participation of women in the economy, etc. But I mean, we are very far from equality. So, I mean, there's a huge gender pay gap. Violence against women is rampant. In many places in the world, sexual violence in conflict is a weapon of war. So, and, and that means uh, preaching to the converted sometimes sounds uh, well I mean, we, we all agree here but a, the, a shift in power means some crisis and uh, that, that that should be taken into account i think part of the narrative here is this is a win-win strategy so i mean underscoring that it is also good for men to share care responsibility is important and that, that also means mental health care and other uh, services should should also cater for for, for that uh, but i think if 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 one takes from, from your question that women have gone too far, so we, we need to comfort men on, on their traditional role, and we are, we are in disagreement on that. And, and uh, I think our effort is going the extra mile on underscoring which which the gaps are. And, and clearly, this is one of the big gaps. I think there's already been this linking between I mean, parts of inequalities for women including the environment of bias against women has to do with economic dependence on women and part of the economic dependence of women 
is related to the fact that care work is, is unpaid or most of care work is, is unpaid. So there's equal time devoted to an activity that is not lucrative and that burdens women. So part of the idea of uh, freeing that burden and sharing that, that burden will give more opportunities for freedom for women. And that means some women might choose a traditional role and that's fine. I mean, that, that's the freedom, but some might, might not. And uh, the social system should be geared to offer more opportunities is, instead of uh, repeating the role or reproducing, re re reproducing this, this traditional role. And I, I think another issue that came also in the questions is, is the need for more data on that. Some of CEDAW's Article 5 and uh, as target 5.4 of, of the SDGs are sometimes dormant clauses. They, they are nice there that they've been there, but there has been little effort to measure. So we need more data. I think these initiatives are important. Uh, they have methodological issues because some, some of this is just self-reporting. So we, we need to turn that into official data in order to measure which are the gaps. Uh, some are difficult to measure, but some are fairly easy to measure. So, I mean, costing the economic value of unpaid care work is an important issue in, in order to then uh, direct public policies to, to change the, the, the situation. So building on um, and UNICEF's initiative is also important I mean, on, on building indicators that, that then can offer measurable parameters in order to see how far away from the goals we established is important for public policies. So, wanted to comment on the, the paternity leave question. Um, there is data that uh, countries with longer paternity leave have greater um, gender equality, but the important issue becomes it's actually not having the policy, it's whether men take leave. Um, the household data from the, some from the UK and from Sweden, um, there's not as much from Global South because it's a newer phenomenon, fewer men taking it. Um, but if men take leave, we see increases in women's income um, at the household level. Um, on average, when men take more leave. That has led some of us to think about, and there's a few corporations that are actually making paternity leave obligatory. Um, that not only do we come and ask you, should you take these six weeks, where we offer 14 weeks, but to say, we're coming to say, you've got 14 weeks, let's plan when you go and when you come back without assuming you're going to take less than the 14 weeks. I think how do we look at some nudge approaches like that, that don't make it negotiable, to make it normal. To Blessing's point about, you know, where we see it crash is that you can have great policies, um, but if the workplace doesn't encourage it, if I don't feel secure in that departure from a workplace, I won't take it. Um, women have faced this for decades. Um, partly what we're helping men to do is, is how can we negotiate this together? And I think that's the important part, that it doesn't become men doing this on our own, but this becomes us together making it a caring workplace. Look forward to talking more about, um, about that idea. On the... Um, on the structural aspect that we, I just heard about a colleague in Argentina who did something, they did something very creative, which was present a bill, an invoice to members of Argentina's Congress of this is what care work has been costing you. We, on behalf of Women's Rights Organization, presenting you a bill of this is what our work has been subsidizing the economy. I think there's something we could learn from that of is this that we do our individual accounting as men <laughs> or as women sharing with our male partners that this is what we've been. Um, but I do think there is something to that. We were brainstorming with the same colleague from Argentina of could we present a big symbolic bill at Davos? Of uh, These are the billions <laughs> that you as global corporations have been receiving by not acknowledging care work. Um, so I would love to think more about that question, whoever asked it, because I think we and I, I would look again at the importance of the women who have led this cause, feminist economists who have said forever, we need to include in the accounting of our GDPs, care work. And I think to add to that would be to say, there's a lot of creative ways we could show that bill, <laughs> take that invoice to those who should be paying for it and are getting this free subsidy. So important question. I think what are you? Not that I want to be the final word, but I am very much aware of the time. And I see one thread without going too much into the data because you all have done such a good job with your expertise. Um, the one thing I do want to pick up though is about the universal um, care and universal um, 
income, something is related there. But I'll, I'll just put that out there for you experts to deal with the downloads or um, yeah. So what I want to mention is I think we'll put the thread in between all of us is the toxic masculinity and the pain that men live with. That is very important to acknowledge and also say that it comes from pain, right? Pain produces pain. One of the things that we talk about in the feminist movement is like the the violence um, that men bring is because they have also witnessed or experienced. And I always say I feel sorry for the people who are throwing the bombs or raping women or doing all of these violent actions because the pain that they must be enduring, enduring. the recovery from something, from something, from something, something like, like that, that is it's just, just as bad as, as the victim itself. So I wanted to bring that up because it is important to create a non-violent atmosphere. And that can be, I feel like, our ultimate goal. And the way to do that is to really show, and I'll go back to who was the one with the cat on the back. But you know, to really show, <laughs> to really show the pleasure and the joy of caring. We on the, you know, women's side have been the benefit, the beneficiaries of that. I mean, my favorite thing in the world, I say, my achievements have been my children and the joy. They bring to me and now my grandchildren. But I don't want to sound like, oh, this is like, you know, just promoting women. It really is a human joy that we experience that we want to share with our male allies. And I think once you experience that, I think that that should be the ultimate goal in bringing joy and pleasure into everyone's life so that we can have a nonviolent atmosphere. Thank you. And, uh, and thanks to all the panelists, Shovo, um, Chris, Gary, and, uh, and uh, the friends uh, the tour, uh, the questions, the reflection. Um, it, it's one uh, yet another conversation that we need to take forward, uh, but also uh, take it outside of this room to our own uh, constituents and stakeholders and continue to advocate and push for the change of policies and the socializing of these norms. Um, whomever is in New York next week, please join us in celebrating the International Day of Care uh, on the 31st of October. There's 